Good day to you. And before we get going for my class records, I'd like to take a photograph of you. So on three, I'd like you to smile and then I'll, I'll snap one. Okay, so one, two, yeah, I don't have a camera in my hands, but you were prepared to smile, right? You probably were because in America, we're taught that when a photograph is taken of you, that you smile, whether you're happy or not. You could be in the most glum mood, and yet when somebody's taking a photo and they ask you to smile, you put it on. When did that start happening? I mean, if you look back at the photographs from the 1700s, 1800s, even early 1900s, people are not smiling in photographs. I, I don't know. That might make an interesting study. That could point out maybe how the, um, the, the industry of professional photography maybe started to create that because it was... Um, beneficial to marketing the photographs when the photographs were taken to sell them. Maybe it just became ingrained in our culture that way. Regardless, smiling in a photograph is an example of nonverbal communication. And that's our subject today, is how nonverbal communication relates to intercultural communication. What is nonverbal communication? Well, the easiest way to define it is it is any communication other than verbal communication. So it includes the way we use our hands, our faces, our body posture, even the way that we decorate our offices and our houses and our dorm rooms and our apartments and our kitchens. This is all nonverbal communication. And sometimes nonverbal communication is intentional. It means you're trying to give off a sign to somebody else that you're upset or happy or you're in agreement with them. Other times it's unintentional. It's giving away um, things that maybe you're not intending to give away, like that you're not telling the truth when you're not looking somebody in the eye. So nonverbal communication is both intentional and unintentional. Also, nonverbal communication can be misunderstood, and that is kind of why we're studying it in, in this particular class today, because we want to try and erase some of those misunderstandings so that we can have better intercultural communication. Regardless, we know that nonverbal communication is a very important part of communication, and some researchers in my field um, estimate that it actually occupies 60 to 80 percent of the meaning in a person's communication with another person. 60 to 80 percent, which is saying that nonverbal communication is more important in some ways than verbal communication. That's pretty interesting to me. So let's take on some of the concepts that Fred Yant exposes in this chapter on nonverbal communication. The first category of concepts that we're going to talk about is called nonverbal functions. And if you see me looking away right now, that's one of the nonverbals that you're probably trying to figure out what's going on. Well, I have my notes to the side of my camera here today in my office in Monroe Hall at East Stroudsburg University, and so I'm looking away. But that could be an example of a nonverbal communication that you may have interpreted otherwise. At any rate, I got a little bit deviated there. Let's get picked back up with nonverbal functions. That is, what kinds of functions do nonverbals play for us when we communicate? And the first function we know is that nonverbals can replace spoken messages. Uh, sometimes you have no ability to speak a message. Things are too noisy, or if you were to speak, it would be out of place. And so you use nonverbals as a replacement. This past weekend, I went to a graduation. Uh, high school graduation, which is they're going on a lot in the next couple weeks. And on the way in the car, some of the students at this school were saying, oh, I can't believe they chose a certain person as a keynote speaker. And they were saying that this person is going to go on and on and on, is going to go off on tangents. Well, I didn't know anything about this speaker, so I just sat and listened. Um, once I was sitting in the audience and the keynote speaker started to speak, uh, she started to tell a story. And at that moment, my son taps me on the leg. And that was a way of saying to me, see, I told you. Um, at least that's the way I interpret it. Um, uh, that's not something he could have said out loud in that kind of a setting. Um, so it's an example of replacing spoken messages as a function of nonverbal communication. A second function of nonverbal communication is sending uncomfortable messages. Uh, if, if you've been involved in a situation where people are gossiping, and then you get around a person who you heard has been gossiping about you, and they see you, and then up go the arms like this on you. And this may be a way of sending the uncomfortable message of, hey, I'm blocking myself against you. I'm protecting myself. I've, it's like I've got a shield right here um, that I'm keeping up to stop you from doing anything worse to my reputation. 
And so sometimes we use nonverbal communication as a function of sending uncomfortable messages. A third function of nonverbal communication is forming impressions. It's very interesting to me when students come to meet me during my office hours, um, especially students I don't know because I'm the chairperson and I see a lot of different students uh, to sign cards, and to give advice, and to um, answer questions about the major, and a lot of students I've never met before. And when they come into my office door, some of them stand before they um, before being invited to sit down. Um, some of them come up and introduce themselves to me and out with an outstretched arm to shake my hand. Um, some call me Dr. McKenzie. Others call me Rob. Uh, it's a way of forming impressions. It's very important to some people that they inform very good first impressions. Um, just think about talking to somebody who's been in the military. If you're a man... And you speak uh, if you're a man and you speak to somebody who is in the military, almost always, if you are in a position of authority, they refer to you as sir. Uh, it's it's part of the military hierarchy, of, uh, not hierarchy, it's a part of uh, the military way of showing respect and, and discipline. At least that's the way I see it. Uh, and so forming impressions is a way that we use nonverbal communication. That's very important to you, by the way, when you go to interview for jobs in terms of the clothes you wear and the way that you conduct yourself when you walk into a person's office to be interviewed. And that's why we actually have mock interviews here at East Strasburg University to help you with those nonverbal communication um, um, areas of forming impressions. A fourth function of nonverbal communication uh, is making relationships clear. Um, think about when you started to date somebody and you weren't certain about them. Maybe later you became certain about them, but in the beginning you weren't certain about them. And so when they started to touch you in places that you didn't feel comfortable, maybe putting their arm around you, maybe putting their face close to you, and so you backed off or you pulled away or you didn't reciprocate by putting your arm around them, um, that's making the relationship clear. And it's another function of nonverbal communication, in that case saying, hey, you're going too far for my comfort level. I want you to take it slower or stand back. Um, a fifth function of nonverbal communication is to regulate interaction. Regulate, re regulating interaction is sort of like the, the pacing of the interaction. You know, when one person speaks and when that person stops and when another person speaks and when another person stops. And think about when you've been in an argument with somebody and they've said a lot of things that you want to respond to, but they keep talking. And so finally, you raise your voice. And it's that tone of raising your voice. And maybe you put your finger up or maybe you put your hand up like a stop sign saying, hold it right there. I want to say some things about what you just said. Um, that's regulating interaction. Um, sometimes families sitting around a dinner table. Um, if you have a formal setting around the dinner table... Um, sometimes the younger kids will look for a cue from mother, dad when they can talk or when they can get up from the table. And it could just simply be dad or mom pushes his or her chair away from the table. And suddenly that means that everybody is, is free to get up and start talking and doing dishes or whatever. It's a way of regulating the interaction. And finally, we have the function of nonverbal communication that is reinforcing it's reinforcing the verbal communication. Think about um, somebody who's been angry, who's walked away and they've slammed the door behind them. Uh, the slamming of the door is a nonverbal communication. It's reinforcing that they are um, angry. Uh, think about somebody who has been so happy that when they see you, they run up and they give you the bear hug. It's not just a regular hug like, great to see you. It's a, oh, I'm so happy I got in. I got into whatever school I'm applying to. And that is a way of reinforcing the verbal, communica the verbal communication that's going on. Now that we have discussed functions, let's move on to types. And here we're going to introduce some different countries. Uh, this particular chapter does a lot with, uh, I think, some very great examples of how nonverbal communication differs across the world. And I hope you are paying attention to those differences in countries because it's what makes the world such an interesting place, at least in one respect. So let's head in now to types of nonverbal communication. And the first type of nonverbal communication is space. Now, the United States is a, a pretty big country. It's so only the third biggest country in the world. I don't know if you knew that. Um, the first biggest country is Russia. Um, and the second is, uh, yeah, our northern neighbor, Canada. Um, who would have thought? 
and our third, uh, the third is the United States. But within the United States, our population of somewhere around um, 330 million, I think it was the latest count, somewhere around there, um, we have a lot of wide open space. Here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of wide open space. You especially go to the Midwest, a lot of wide open space. So when people stand next to each other, um, they stand farther apart. They can stand three feet apart from each other. But if you speak to um, your average Arabic person, um, the space is very, very close. You can be standing, in, um, and I know Arabic is a way too broad of a term, but a lot of Arabic peoples, people from the Middle East, um, they don't stand very far from each other at all. That's because their use of space is different. And even if you go to a place like England and you ride on a bus or the train, you're sitting much closer to people than you do on buses in the U.S. So one type of nonverbal communication is proxemics. A second type is kinesics. Kinesics basically refer to body language. It's gestures. It's body movements. It's facial expressions. Um, if you're doing this in the United States, you're hitchhiking. If you're doing this in Greece, you're kind of saying, you know, F off. You know, you're, you're giving, you're telling somebody to, you know, get out of here, um, to leave you alone. Uh, it's an example of how body movements and body uh, and facial expressions and, and gestures can be interpreted very, very differently between cultures. And that's kinesics. It's about how you use your face. Um, even the smiling example that I started class off with today, um, to smile in Japan for a photograph um, is seen as inappropriate. It doesn't capture sort of your neutral persona. It captures you in a, in a false state, a false state of happiness. And so that's kinesics as a type of nonverbal communication. Next up is chronemics. Chronemics is the use of time. And here I will go back to Mexico because Mexico is a country that gets closer to the equator. And the closer you get to the equator, the more there is a sense that, that time is slower and is going to come around again anyhow. So people are always late in Mexico, and that's very average in Latin American countries too, like up to two hours late um, if you invite them over to a party. Um, not fashionably late, 15 minutes or half an hour, but two hours. And that's because as you get closer to the equator when the days are longer and it's warmer, there's a sense that, you know, if 12 o'clock doesn't happen today, it's coming around again tomorrow, just like a spoke on a bike wheel. It's going to spin around and come around tomorrow. And so here in the east, in Pennsylvania, our use of time is much more calculated as we go farther north. Um, our days are planned from morning till night, a lot of us anyhow, and we feel that we're trying to squeeze things in. It's a very different feeling in Mexico. There's, ah, there's mañana. That's where that saying comes from. Mañana, tomorrow. There's always tomorrow because of their sense of chronemics or the use of time. Next up is, is as a type of nonverbal communication is paralanguage. And that's the voice and the use of the tone in your voice. And even the way I introduced that term, paralanguage, was to try to stress the importance of that term to make it stand out to you. Um, I'm using my nonverbal communication, uh, the tone of my voice, to suggest to you, here's a word that I want you to remember when I give the definition in the example. Next up is the type of communication that is known as silence. Uh, if you've ever gone to a, a, a gathering, a party, um, a sport event, and there are two people in the same room who are mad at each other, a lot of times silence is used to convey that. It's not even that they're going to expend the energy to say, listen, I'm, you really pissed me off what you did. Instead, they're just going to say, you know, I'm going to sort of pretend you don't exist by my silence. It's a, it's a use of, of a, it's a type of nonverbal communication. Um, next up is haptics. Uh, the United States is one of the least touching cultures, which is what haptics is all about. It's the use of touch. Uh, I'm sure that you've, sp you've spoken to people, or particularly Mediterranean peoples, that, that would be people who live along the Mediterranean, like Spaniards, French, Italians. They're very touch-oriented. When you talk to them, they're touching you often on your arm and your shoulder area, not your head, not your, your chest, not your stomach. They're touching you on your arm. Um, that's seen as a very appropriate way for Mediterranean peoples to speak, to get your attention, to, to touch you. In the United States, we don't tend to do that um, unless we are perceiving that we want to get intimate with somebody or that we already have a kind of an intimate relationship with a person. Not necessarily meaning romantic, but we know them very well. Next up as a type of communication is uh, what is known as artifactual communication. 
And that is the way that we arrange objects around us to communicate things. It's it's some um, artifactual communication. For example, behind me, some of you may recognize the photo of Keith Richards. Many may not. He's very long in the tooth now, even though the Stones are on tour, but he's a guitarist for the Stones. And I, I want people to know when they come into my office that not only do I, I really like the Rolling Stones, but my favorite guy in the band is Keith Richards. And then over here on this side, on top of the my, um, my shelves there, is the MTVU Woody Award which WESS Radio, our campus radio station, won in 2014, making it the best college radio station in the country. And I want people to see that I am very proud of our radio station, which I advise for having won that award and being for an entire year MTV's um, anointed best college radio station in the country. Think about your room right now. T take a quick look around. Look at all the things that you have trying to display what kind of person you are. That's artifactual communication. Next up is territoriality. I don't know if you have a neighbor who's like this, but um, I have a neighbor that uh, when I moved in, he had already lived there. And uh, when I moved in, I built my house. So he had all this land next to him. And it took him a while, but he kept sort of mowing parts of my land. It was almost like he had sort of taken over that land when nobody was living there. And he thought that he should still continue to do that because it was his land. So he was mowing parts of my land. I finally had to say to him, he's not a bad guy or anything, not, not a mean guy. I can do my own lawn. That's territoriality. And we do that all the time. When you, when you go to a, a, an event, a, a dinner, and, and you, there's a good seat available and you put your sweater down to save space for somebody else, it's using territoriality. It's saying this space is mine and not yours. And finally, we finish with olfactics. Olfactics is, use, is a, a type of uh, nonverbal communication that uses smell. Um, we don't know a lot about olfactics, but we do know that certain cultures, um, for example, the ancient Romans, um, use smell to communicate a sense of well-being and prestige in some cases. And the Romans used roses. They were very in love with roses, and you would always find roses indoors. And of course, roses have a very special smell to them. Um, it's, it's sort of a perfumey smell um, as a, compared to a fragrance. There's sort of a, a, a more an elitist uh, feeling to it. And so you could see maybe how roses could be used by the Roman Empire in that way. Um, on the back end of this chapter, the book goes into this study of a, a case study of Thailand. And it talks about the why. Um, the why is, the, is a way that people greet each other in Thailand and in, and in other um, Asian cultures. Um, where they're trying to show a sense of respect. And it involves um, putting your palms together like this and then bowing downwards. And normally the protocol, um, that is what is expected, is for the younger person or the person in a lesser position of authority to initiate the why, and then that's followed by the person in the position of authority responding with the same bow and the same why. So we can say that this happens in China and Japan, but in the, in the book, uh, Thailand is discussed as a case study. And then finally, the book ends with um, nonverbal misinterpretations, which is what we're trying to avoid if we're trying to have the absolute optimal communication between cultures. And the case study ends with a study between Korean American businesses. And Koreans coming to the United States, particularly in Los Angeles, which is where this author lives close to and wrote about, probably got the idea for this case study. A lot of Korean, they're cold Korean neighborhoods. Um, Koreans come from a very formal culture and a very direct culture as well. So if you go to a Korean business and they don't have a product, they may say to you, go, come back later. And it sounds so harsh to us because we're not, we're not used to that. We might be more used to something along the lines of, um, I'm sorry, we don't have that product. Can you come back on Monday? The truck is arriving. It should be here in the afternoon. That's a different kind of level of customer service. Um, but it creates tension in Korean um, communities that are embedded within um, greater American communities when Americans shop in Korean stores. And it's just one example. Another example is when you give change back. Um, do you put a, the cash in a purse in the customer's hand? Well, in Korean businesses, often the cash goes on the counter, which leads sometimes leads Americans to say, you know, this person is being rude. They're putting the money down and making me go get it instead of just handing it to me. It's not necessarily that they're being rude. 
it's a uh, possibly the sign that Koreans are showing respect and distance um, by not invading your personal space or your proxemics by putting the money on the counter for you to pick up. So you can dig more into that concept in the chapter. But for right now, that's going to wrap up chapter four on nonverbal communication as it relates to intercultural communication. Have a great day.